Whether you like it or not, attention is drawn specifically to the incarnation of Christ. And I do think it's something that shouldn't just be celebrated once a year, but the idea that God Almighty, the Word that was in the beginning, came to dwell among us. And I can't even imagine that, uh, really, that God left heaven, the glories of heaven, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, and was born. And I can't imagine Jesus Christ, God, being dependent on Mary. And I'm grateful. I was reading this week of Mary's song, and do you know she said re she rejoiced in God, her Savior? And so she held the one who would save her. And I think that's just a beautiful picture. Uh, verse one, excuse me, page 101 in your hymn book, Gentle Mary Laid Her Child. It's a tune many of you will be familiar with. Sing with us, page 101. Gentle Mary laid her child lowly in a manger. There he lay the undefiled to the world a stranger. Such a babe in such a place, can he be the Savior? Ask the saved of all the race, who have found his favor. Angels sang about his birth, wise men sought and found him. Heaven's star shone brightly forth, glory all around him. Shepherds saw the wondrous sight, heard the angels singing. All the plains were lit that night, all the hills were ringing. Gentle Mary laid her child lowly in a manger he is still the undefiled but no more a stranger son of god of humble birth beautiful the story praise his name in all the earth hail the king of Amen. Our last congregational will be page 95. If you would stand, we won't be, um, we don't do the offering past the plate. There are bowls at the back. I would remind you, though, this is a good time to give. Uh, we are supporting missions around the world, and we appreciate uh, the generosity. It's our goal as the body of Christ to spread the message that Jesus not just came and was born, but that he lived and he died and he rose again. And I think it's a very precious part of the story that some of the first evangelists that the angels spoke to were shepherds. They were country folks, amen? Because that's kind of what we are, amen? And they'd been out there with the sheep. Can you imagine the angels showing up and those shepherds deciding, hey, we're going to go see? And then they went and told about it. And uh, you know what? If you experience the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to tell somebody about it. Amen. So let's sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain, page 95. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching O'er silent flocks by night Behold, throughout the heavens There shone a holy light Go tell it on the mountains Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus 
that held our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born. And God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Amen. You may be seated. Our youth choir will come now. Before Dad preaches, they'll be singing, Jesus, what a wonderful name.
Amen. Jesus, the only Savior, the only way to heaven is Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's good to have you in the Lord's house today. I want you to open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24. And we'll continue the series on the family. I also want to remind you that I am full aware <clears throat> that these messages have not been easy for most of us uh, because when we look at the family as God designed it at creation, the family today has very little resemblance to the family that God designed in the book of Genesis. <clears throat> and the ways that families function today is so very much different than the way families function uh, back in Bible times. There's such a, uh, such a difference that it's almost unrecognizable. And so with that said, I want to take you to Joshua chapter 24. And if you'll stand with me, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at several passages. Uh, I'll read Joshua chapter 24, and now I'll let you be seated, and then I will share other passages that are very relevant to this particular series and especially to this message. I'd started preaching the series uh, directly to the men and then I preached a message to the women and now we are at the parents. And you might say, well, those will overlap, will they not? And certainly they will. But parents have a very, very specific and important role uh, in the family. Now, you may say, well, preacher, that's about the most elementary thing that I've heard lately. Certainly, we all know that the parents have a serious role in the family. Well, if that is true, then one would have to question why are parents not practicing their position? Why are parents not practicing the position that God has entrusted to you and I as parents? So with that said, go with me to Joshua 24 and verse 15, where Joshua said, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we're grateful to you. We love you, Lord, and thank you for the joy we have in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to sing those songs, those, those old hymns, Lord, that remind us, Lord, of the birth and the very reason for the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as the children open their mouths wide to sing this morning, Jesus is this world's only Savior. And God, how we praise you for that. Lord, teach us today, grow us, enlighten us, Lord, with your word, and move us, God, by your spirit. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen, you can be seated. <clears throat> Having a little trouble with my voice this morning, so I would ask you in advance to <laughs> pray for me and bear with me as I'm struggling a little bit just with my voice today. Now, some of you go, well, does that mean we're going to get out early? And the case is no. And so with Joshua 24, 15, I want you to back all the way up with me to the book of Genesis. Now, I know that makes a little, some of you nervous to think that we're going to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. But I believe that it is very important for us to look at the biblical family as is given by God, as is designed by God, uh, so that we can understand more and more the importance of the messages uh, on the family, and I might add that even Pastor Clay last week, preaching the Sunday evening message, 
Uh, his message very much overlapped with the series that I'm uh, preaching, and I praise the Lord for that. And we certainly don't sit down and, and go over each other's notes, but God sometimes just affirms uh, the necessity of preaching on a particular subject. Now, before I read this, <clears throat> could I encourage you, young and old alike, if you're being distracted right now by the old devil's device, uh, your cell phone, would you just please give honor to God right now and put those things away? Uh, it'd really be a blessing uh, if you do that. And you young people, if you would do that, then I wouldn't have to call you out during the service. Um, and so, and some of you say, would you do that? Uh-huh. <clears throat> I did that to Clay one time, Deb's son. <clears throat> Some of you remember, but Clay was a teenager, and, and I don't know why that particular morning, but he didn't sit with Miss Deb. And uh, I noticed about 15 minutes into the service, Clay and a couple of his buddies were sitting right back here. The sanctuary is much smaller than, as a matter of fact, this section wasn't even here, and the pulpit was about right here. And so I had a much better view. That's why I had him to raise that up so we could, I could have the same view. And uh, Clay and a couple of his buddies, they were not paying attention. And so uh, I made eye contact with them, and uh, they ignored my eye contact. Uh, and so I made eye contact with them again. They ignored that, so I finally just stopped. And I said, Clay, you and Nathan and Denver get up and get right up here on the front. Uh, I said, you other boys sit with your parents. Clay, you come up here on the front. And they started to go around the back. I said, no, come right down the center where everybody can see you. And you might say, I can't believe you'd do that. God is deserving of our attention, amen? amen. He's deserving of our attention. And so I would encourage you um, to put away whatever is distracting you. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, and verse uh, number 26. Now, this is God's design, and it's very relevant. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And there is no other, there is no other creation, not animals, nothing else that is made in the image of God. It is man that is made in the image of God. Now, if you understand that, say amen. amen. And man alone. The Bible says there will be a time when men will worship the creature more than the creator. And that's going on in our culture today. And, um, and again, not to get on anybody's toes here, but God did not make your pet in his own image. He made you in his own image. Now, he gave you dominion over the other things that he created. And we are to care for those things that he has put under our watch care. We are to care for those things. But they are not created in the image of God, and they must not be worshipped as being created in the image of God. And so, with that said, the Bible says that in the beginning, God created male and female in his image. Now, I'm going to just read this. He says, In our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. <clears throat> now listen, this is, not just a, this is not just an amen moment. I want you to understand this. I know that there are certain verses that preachers like to read and everybody says amen. Uh, every verse that's in the Word of God, we should affirm by saying amen. Amen? amen. amen. This is not just an amen moment. This is so relevant in our culture today because this tells us what the God-designed family is supposed to look like. And we've moved so far from that that we have a couple of generations now and we're, in, uh, we're probably in the process of losing another that truly does not know what a God-designed family is supposed to look like. Now, with that said, and God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male 
and female created he them. Now, if we really believe the Word of God, do you really believe the Word of God? Say amen. amen. Then we must understand that there is no other definition of family that can be biblically validated except a man and a woman, a male and a female. Okay? Now you might say, preacher, we know that. That's an amen moment. No, it's not. In our culture, we have redefined, we have redescribed, if you will, what God has designed. We have abandoned that, and now family, by definition in America today, family is so distorted that if we do not go back to the landmark that God has given to us, in a few generations, we will have, listen, we'll even have churches that are filled with people that do not know what the Bible family is supposed to look like. Because preachers are afraid to preach it, teachers are afraid to teach it, and we're afraid to stand up and say, not on my watch. We will not succumb to these things. We will not bow down to the edicts of the world. We're not going to just bow down. We're going to go back to the landmark of the Word of God, and all God's people ought to say, Amen. Now, so he said, I've created a family here, a male and a female. And he, he told them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, we don't have to have flashcards or me draw you little stick figures for you to understand that the Bible says, I'm going to put a man and a woman, a male and a female together, and in that union, they are to come together in the flesh. They're already one in the spirit and one in the flesh, and they are to multiply and replenish the earth. Now, with that said, we would be made to believe in our country today that how many of you all remember, especially back in the 70s and 80s, when, oh, the earth is getting overpopulated. I heard death and it about made me want to puke. Overpopulated. Did you know that the old devil used that to plant in the minds of American families that if you had more than two children, there was something wrong with you? If you, as a matter of fact, I think Planned Parenthood has done the math now, and they say that the, the right family is 1.6 children. Now, God, I don't get that. I'm sorry. I just don't get that. Now, I, I've never seen a family show up for church with 1.6 children. You know, I mean, I have to round everything off to make it come, up, come out, you know. Now, I've seen a lot of people show up to church that had half cents, but not half children. And so, I'm simply saying that God has a design. He said, I'm going to put a male and a female together in the institution of marriage. Amen. Amen. Not in the institution of shacking up, but in the institution of marriage. And their role is to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. God has never changed his mind. So, you have the family. And I praise the Lord for that. I remember we were getting ready to... Uh, put the sign up down here that sends everybody up to Lindsay Chapel. And we've had all kinds of signs down there on the corner. And people, we put a sign up, and people shoot holes in them, and that's fine. And I noticed the other day somebody's really unloaded on this one. They've shot 15 or 20 holes in this one. And, and that's all right because God knows who's doing that. And, uh, and listen, not, that don't bother me a bit. Uh, they're shooting holes at God, and God will take care of that mess. <clears throat> but we were getting ready to, to have the sign. And so. If you literally, if you go to logos uh, and ask for families, it'll, 99 times out of 100, it'll show a man and a woman and two children. The perfect family. And so Miss Deb had the idea. She said, let's, let's don't put just two children. How many do we put on there? Anyway, the sign has a man and a woman and a whole pot load of kids. I love that. <laughs> I mean, a load of kids. Because the Bible says be fruitful and multiply, okay? Now, so that's, that's the basic. And now, let me move on with this situation with the family and how that it no longer resembles the family that God created. So over in chapter 2 of Genesis, the Bible says, and uh, in, ch in chapter 1, it just says that God created them and he gave them a role. In chapter 2, he gives some detail about how that came to be. 
In verse 18 of chapter 2, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And so out of the ground, and I'll not read all of that, but the Bible says in verse number 20, And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help meet. So God caused the sleep to come over Adam. He took the rib out of Adam and he created the woman and he presented the woman to Adam. And so we have that, that more specific uh, uh, description of that creation of the family. And as I look at that today and realize that that is so much different than what we have come to describe as a family. Now I want you to just take some of the things that I'm going to share with you this morning and however the Lord leads you. But I, I just made a couple of phone calls this week and just asked a few questions. And did you know that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, when the Bible says to the fathers and actually to the parents, because in a marriage... When the Lord oftentimes, when he says, Father, he's not excluding the mother, of course. Um, when he says fathers, he's not excluding the wife. He, he's, we're one in the spirit and one in the flesh. And so the, the admonition or the reproof or whatever the case may be is generally to both. But when we look at, at Deuteronomy where it says that you're to teach your children and you say, yeah, but things were different back then. And I might add, things were definitely different back then because back then there was actually a fear of God. That's right. There was a fear of God. And you might say, well, I'm glad we've grown out of that. Uh, well, I might say to that, uh, it would be wise for us to ask the Lord to give us a true reverent fear of God. Amen. Because in the fear of God, there is wisdom. And, and so... The Bible says that God told the parents to teach the children. And that, that Deuteronomy chapter 6 is filled with that and, and many other places in Scripture. But then you get over into Ephesians in the New Testament in chapter number 6 where the Bible starts out with children, obey your parents and the Lord for it's right. And then he speaks to the parents again and he uses the word fathers but not to the exclusion of the mothers. And he says, you raise your children, train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But in our culture, we have, we have relegated our responsibility for parental teaching and parental training. We have given that over to the government. And so I made a few calls just so I wanted to be accurate here. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, you didn't get to go to school, or if you lived out in the country like us, you didn't have to go to school until you were six. Uh, and then we found out there was such a thing as kindergarten. And so, um, and you know, maybe you say, well, that's age five up. But now, in our local schools, they have K-3, K-4, then kindergarten, then first grade. So the government is well pleased by taking your children out of your home and out for under your parental control at three years of age. We might call those programs preschool and Head Start, but technically it's K-3, K-4, and then kindergarten. So... For all of those years, for 15 years of the most moldable time in your children's life, we have given them over to the government to teach and train. Now, you might say, but, but, but preacher, that, I mean, that's just what we do. And I would, I would affirm, that's exactly what we do. We turn over what God says was our responsibility to the government. I did the hours did you know that some of our children get on the school bus of a morning between 6.30 and 6.45? And they have after-school programs, and the one locally is called Beacon, and they'll keep the children there after school hours up to 5.30, and they'll feed them their evening snack, not necessarily a full meal, but they'll feed them an evening snack. And so basically now the government will take your children at age three, and they will give them breakfast, lunch, and a small dinner and keep them for just do the math if they get them at seven o'clock in the morning and you don't get them back until five in the afternoon you can just do the math they have had your children 10 hours out of a 24-hour day your children generally need to sleep eight hours of that so parents that gives you about five or six hours with your children 
And many parents do not even give that time to their children. Now, you might say, where's the relevance in all of that? Because God said to the man and the woman, be fruitful and multiply, and you train and teach your children. I have people want to argue, and it's fine, and I can take either side of that. But they say, but preacher, we're still the ones who actually teach basic and, and train our children in basic things. And so it doesn't hurt anything to give them over to the government or the school. And I would simply say this. We've gone a long ways from reading, writing, and arithmetic in the public school in our culture today. Amen? Amen. Listen, the, the world... And I praise God that we have some godly school teachers in our church. I praise God for that. But they understand that their role in the public school is not necessarily to advance kids academically, but maybe give them a little bit of the Word of God and something spiritual while they are there. And I understand that. But as long as Satan can cause our families to give over what he has delegated to us to somebody else, there's little hope for the modern family. There's little hope for the modern family. I know that everyone <clears throat> may not feel like that you have the ability to teach and train your own children, but I would say this, if God gave them to you, God has given you the ability to teach and train your own children. And I would encourage you, and you might say, preacher, but our, our school is a good school. I would just say this. If your school provides restroom facilities for children that can't figure out whether they're a boy or a girl, you need to get your kids out of that school. If your, kid, if your school has bathroom facilities for the little fur kids and those that can't figure out whether they're a child or a dog or a cat, you need to get your kids out of that mess. Amen. Amen. Why would you give your kids to that? God is not pleased with that. And so we have to get back to the landmarks, to those landmarks that God has given us, and we need to practice our position. So as parents, I touched this last week, and I'm just going to give just a, I just touched a point or two on this last week. Parents' responsibility is to teach your children. I just covered that. Your responsibility is to provide for your children, and that means more than food and clothing. As I mentioned last week, that means that you are to provide for your children a safe place, a place called home, a place where your children and, and you, mom and dad, can come together, and it is a safe place. It is a place where the father is, pardon the expression, but the father is the king of the castle, and he does not let things come in to that castle. That could be bad for his family. He guards the gate of the castle, if you will. It is a place where moms and dads should be able to come together with their children and listen, and actually literally sit down and take a meal together, being undisturbed by the world's by the world's addictions, if you will, cell phones and such as that. But we've given all of that over to the devil. I would say that there's only a few families in our church, and, and I'm going to be literally in our church, and I feel like we are the exception. There's not very many families that actually sit down on a daily basis, mom and dad and children, and share a meal together and pray over that meal and truly thank God for God's provision. That is a thing of the past in most families today, and God has a controversy with that. God has a problem with that. We must get back to that landmark. We must get back to that place where God has designed the family. Now with that said, when I think about this castle and the dad being the king of the castle, I want you to turn some further with me. Go to Deuteronomy 22. And I'm going to read to you a verse there. Deuteronomy chapter 22. And look there with me at verse number 8. <clears throat> this will be very interesting. And uh, I want to... Uh, there's some words in the Bible that really jump out at you if you get to studying a particular subject. And this one really caught my eye. Now, probably 10 years ago, I preached a message on this particular verse. But it's Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse number 8. The Bible says, When thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof. 
that thou bring not blood upon thine house, if any man shall fall from thence. Now, some of you, uh, if you're like me, the first time I really picked up on that verse, I thought, what does that really mean? And so I did a little bit of study. And, and let me just describe this to you. We all know the story of David and Bathsheba. And where was David when he looked across and saw Bathsheba? He was on the roof of his house. In that day, a roof was somewhat like a deck or a patio for us today. It was an extension of the house where people would gather and maybe uh, sit in the evening and visit and such as that. Uh, so it was like an extension of the house, like you would, you would have a deck out behind your house. And so uh, this is so practical. Just listen. And so the, the people were actually told how to build their houses. Now, how many of y'all agree that God today is trying to tell us how to build our home? Our home. And he said to the people, when you build a house, when you make accommodations on the roof for people to sit and visit and fellowship, build a battlement around the roof. That would be what we would call today a railing, a safety rail, to where somebody wouldn't just walk up and fall off the roof. Because if somebody fell off of your roof and you did not have a battlement, you were responsible for that person's death or his, his injuries, whatever the case may be. In our day, we would call that liable. You would be liable for their injuries. And so it was just a common thing that you built a battlement to prevent, to prevent somebody from falling out. Now, let me just say this. I believe, that, I believe we can just stretch that just a little bit and say this. It's about time, dads, listen to me. It's about time that you dads built a battlement around your house, not only to keep your kids from falling out, but to keep the enemy from getting in. Amen. You need to build a battlement around your house. You might say, well, that would look stupid, wouldn't it? Uh, people drive down the road and they see this black wrought iron fence all around our house. Uh, I think it'd be a great testimony. Because when your neighbors stop and say, uh, what are you building that black wrought iron fence all around your property for? It'd be a great time for you to say, you know what? I just believe we need to get back to what the Bible says. And the Bible says we need to have a battlement. The Bible says that a man's home is the same as his castle. And when God put a man in a castle, he was responsible for guarding the contents of the castle. God is telling us today how to build our homes. And with that said, let me take you on. And so the Bible says that there are these certain landmarks and things that we need to go back to. So parents, you are to provide that for your children, that place of protection, that place where no one can get in and steal your children from out from under your authority. And then parents, you are to discipline your children. I know that some people kind of cringe at this. And I will say that I often make comments behind this pulpit about, about my father and his discipline and how that, that Miss Deb and I tried to discipline our children as they were growing up. And so I just want to clarify something. Sometimes it comes across like um, I got up every morning and polished my paddle <laughs> and just looked for an opportunity. And, and my children would attest that that was never, ever the case. And I never remember spanking my children in anger because we had learned at an early age in our marriage that we should never discipline or correct our children in anger. So sometimes I sound a little bit overbearing about that. Um, and I might add, I do have the paddle in my office that was given to me as an award when I graduated high school. Um, they said it had my prints on it more than anyone else's. So they gave me the paddle, and I keep it in my office. But I promise you, I've never paddled one of your kids, okay? Uh, but I do well with my own. And so the point I'm making is this. Parents are to discipline their children. It is a disgrace. And I'll just, I just, have, I'll just give this one general example. It is a disgrace to Christianity, when a Christian parent allows a child, I don't care if they're two months old or if they're 20 years old and still living in the home, 
It is a disgrace for parents to let a child control your home. It's a disgrace. It's a terrible testimony. It's an outright rebellion against God. And so parents, I would just say this. You will not find in the Bible where it says pals raise up your children. No, you are a parent, not a pal. Amen. And we ought to be, and I'm going to use a word that is seldom used in our, in our vocabulary anymore, the word bastion, B-A-S-T-I-O-N. That means, uh, that means a wall. That means a, a, a something of security. It, it's the same word as bulwark in the hymn that we sing. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. And that's what the Bible teaches us. And as parents, we have to get back to building that wall and protecting our children and disciplining our children in the ways of God. Folks, listen. It's, it's, I, I, I literally, I don't, I don't like to eat out anymore. First of all, the food might be tainted some. But nonetheless, when you sit down in a restaurant and there's people sitting across from you and their children are literally totally out of control. And if you haven't seen that lately, you hadn't been out much. And parents that I know profess to be Christians allow that. They allow their children to throw food all over them. They, they allow their children to act like animals in public places. And I just let me just say this to you. If you're a Christian parent and your kids are not under control, keep them at home until you can get them under control. Amen. Do a favor to society. And do a favor to God until you get them under control so that they would not cause you to be a public embarrassment. Calling ourselves Christian and letting our children run the homes. Parents can't even make plans without asking the kids. Parents can't even... I, you, you might say, are you kidding? No, listen. There's parents that cannot attend churches... Let me take that back. Will not because they don't have enough spiritual guts to do it because the kids don't want to go. Because the kids don't want to go. I had a young man tell me the other day, I invited him to church. And I'm just telling you what he told me. He may be listening in today and I will not use your name because I'll, I'll do my best to protect the ignorant. He said, I want to come. I'd love to come. But he said... One of my daughters just don't want to come to church. And I thought, well, she must be 20 years old or maybe 30. I said, but I looked at him, and he's only about 26. I said, well, how old is that daughter? She said, he said, eight. Now, some of you are going, are you serious? I'm serious. I had a conversation with that man in person, and they can't be in the house of God, or he's not man enough to be in the house of God because he's got an eight-year-old that controls the home. That's on Tech Center Road. You might say, well, what a shame. So how are things in your house? I mean, do your children dictate to you where you'll go and when you go and how you go and if you go? And I know it, man, it gets quiet, doesn't it? Goodness. Some years ago, I walked into the sanctuary when it was smaller than this. There were these two little boys. I mean, they were running just as fast as they could run. And so I just reached down and grabbed them. <laughs> they didn't know I was anywhere around. Boy, they looked at me. And I said, you boys, stop running in the sanctuary. And one of them looked at me and says, God said for you not to boss me. <laughs> I go, do what? He goes, God said for you not to boss me. And I said, well, until God tells me that, you don't be running in the church. <laughs> How many of y'all understand this is the sanctuary of God? Amen. And I believe the sanctuary of God in some ways ought to be hallowed ground. In our own church, we have to have a sign out front that says, don't bring your food into the church. Now, I understand people sometimes have medical situations where they need to bring a drink into the church and drink some water. I understand that. I'm not a legalist about that. But have we not moved a long ways from the landmark? Have we not moved a long ways from that standard that God so graciously and meticulously set up for us? 
Parents, the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. There was something about that verse that jumped out at me this time because I'd been using the term, practice your position. For years, I have, I guess you could say, carelessly quoted that verse by saying, He that spareth the rod hateth his son. It doesn't say, He that spareth the rod. It says, He that spareth his rod. You might say, well, what's the difference? There's a world of difference. Listen, God gave to the man, to the parent, a position. And that position of, of disciplining came with the rod that was given to the parent, or I'll say to the man, and that verse says, he that spareth his rod. So if it is a rod given by God to the man, then the man should use the rod for the purpose with which it was given to him. And it doesn't say, um, now Johnny, you knew better than that. I'm mocking some men that I know. Now Susie, you know that. You, can't, you mustn't do that, Susie. I've warned you 12 times. I've counted to 10, 12 times. Some of y'all remember that count the 10 crap. I've seen it on display. I was at Walmart one day. This kid got on a bicycle. He was trying to ride the bicycle around. And the mother goes, you, one, two, three. And she got all the way to nine and Billy got off the bike. And she goes, he gets right back on. She goes, one, two. And I'm going, that's not the height of stupidity. I've never seen it. I'm, doing, I'm being real with you. God says to the man and to the woman, you come together in that sacred act of marriage. And it's a sacred institution. Not to be mocked at. And in our culture, when we, out in, our, out in the public, when we speak of a marriage of a man and a woman coming together in holy matrimony, that's a biblical thing, you see. Coming together, raising children, godly seed. And in our culture, you will be laughed at for that. Matter of fact, somebody may mock you and say, that is so old-fashioned. I mean, the family today can look like this, this, or this. And if you ever give in to that, your family is sunk. And so God has given us these landmarks and he's given us these positions. And he says, I not only give you a position, but I will give you what it takes to practice the position. And he says, he that spareth his rod, the rod that God gave to you, if you spare that rod, it's proof that you do not love your children, you hate them. Pastor Clay and I and other men in this church preach in the prisons every week. We're, we're in the prisons every week. And we preach to young men. And I know I, Miss, Miss Kathy going into the women's prison. And I want to tell you what we see. We see young people that are now incarcerated. And they're incarcerated, sure, for a crime they committed. But they're incarcerated because they did not have a parent that taught them that it was right to obey authority. That means that the policeman down the street is not the fuzz and he's not a pig. He is an officer ordained by God to keep the peace. And we have children that speak of our, of our law enforcement like, there's, they, like they've got some kind of a plague. They make comments toward, toward to our, even our first responders and people that are there to help, and they treat them as if they're some kind of a, of a, a misfits. And our parents allow that. I tell you, when I was growing up, if I addressed a police officer in a disrespectful way, it didn't happen at our house. If I addressed a spiritual man, a pastor, 
If I didn't address them with respect, there was consequence for that. But in our day, we've moved so far from the landmark, and God has a controversy with that. God has a controversy with that. I preach these messages not to beat up on, because everyone I preach, it always comes back to me being challenged in my own family. Our children are grown, but we have influence with our grandchildren. And so it comes back to me as well. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, 18, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Proverbs twenty two fifteen Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Proverbs 23, Withhold not correction from the child. All through the Word of God, the Proverbs, the Psalms, in Ephesians, all through the Word of God, we have the call of God to bring children into this world and understand that they are not ours, they belong to God. They have been lent to us by God. Just as Hannah said concerning her baby Samuel, he said we're going to give this child back to God because we know this child is a gift from God. He belongs to God. And as long as he is lent to us, we're going to raise him in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Folks, listen, I hate to bother you here, but you're not raising your children, you're raising God's children. You're raising God's creation. And you, you have no right to raise them in any other manner except that which God has clearly given to us. These children belong to God. The Bible says the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. So we are in possession of God's children, God's creation. And we have a mandate from God. And in the Bible tells us that not only the discipline of our children, but actually controlling our children. Sir, did you know that one of the qualifications for being a bishop, a pastor, or even a deacon or elder in the church, you can read this various places, but in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says that one of the qualifications for a man being in the ministry, like pastoral ministry or such as that, or even leadership, deacon and elder and such as that, that one of the common qualifications is that you have your children under subjection. That you have your children under subjection. You might say, well, why would God mention something like that? Because it's a landmark. Because it's a, it's a standard. You might say, yeah, but that's for deacons and elders and preachers. Listen, that's just a qualification for that office, but it's not to the exclusion of every man who fathers a child. Amen. The Bible says we are to keep our children under subjection. That simply means that we are to, we are to discipline them according to the Word of God. We are to control our children and not allow our children to control us. Listen, man, I mentioned this a few weeks ago. I often have families in my office or we have families in our home. And many times it's almost impossible for the adults to sit down and visit because the children are so out of control. So out of control. And that's an abomination to a very, very holy God. We moved away from those standards. I know uh, <clears throat> when I was growing up, we had to go to bed at 8.30. Remember that, Steve? 8.30. For years, I never knew that Bonanza had but 30 minutes. I never knew what, I, I never knew what happened to little Joe or Hoss because we could only watch 30 minutes of Bonanza because it was on a, a Sunday night and we had to go to bed at 8.30. <clears throat> you know, I never remember my dad saying, all right, boys, you need to get to bed. No, he would go. <clears throat> How many of y'all old enough to, to remember that sound? <clears throat> meant, I don't have to tell you what the rule is. You know what the rule is. You might say, oh, your dad must have been a real slave driver. My dad loved Jesus and he loved his children. And he taught us that one time, 
First time obedience was the standard. First time obedience was the standard. I praise God that I had a dad like that. And I praise God that I had a mother that supported my dad as they raised us children. We have a problem in the American home today. Many men who attempt to be the man of the house are shot down by a wife and a mother because they're not on the same page. They're not on the same page. Dad will lay down a standard, a good standard, a godly standard. The kids cry to mom. So mom moves the mark. And it goes the other way as well. Oftentimes the father will undermine the authority of, of the wife because that authority is delegated to parents. And obviously the man is the head of the wife, but parents have authority over their children. Many times the mother, in the absence of a dad, being home, she may draw a line. Dad comes in from work and Johnny runs to dad and says, Mom said this. He goes, oh, it, it's okay, we'll go ahead and... Dad, you know what you've done? You've not just undermined your, undermined your wife, you've undermined your own authority. Wives, when you move the mark that your husband has set, the father has set, you haven't just undermined him, you've undermined your own position. Because what you've taught your children is the line of authority can be moved based on the situation. Parents, you need to get on the same page. You might say, it's hard for parents to get on the same page. I agree if you're reading out of different books. Can you imagine what a house would look like if the builders all used a different tape measure? Well, that's what our families in America look like today because the parents are not on the same page because they're not reading out of the same book. Amen? Amen. You know, it really don't matter what Oprah says. And I wouldn't pay much for what Dr. Phil said. But I, we ought to cherish what our Father in Heaven says. We ought to cherish what He says. Because He'll never, ever be wrong. The Word of God can never, ever be wrong. I'm going to give you a couple of biblical illustrations before I close. Parents, you are to control your children. You don't have to turn to these places, but I would like for you to make a note of them so you can study them, read them in your quiet time. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, through about the first four chapters of 1 Samuel, the Bible says that there was a man named Elkanah and his wife was Hannah. And they were barren. They could not conceive. And they would pray. And if you read the story, it's amazing. It's amazing how that in that day, that children were honestly and truly seen as a great heritage and a blessing from God. We have married couples today that act like children are nothing more than a headache. The Bible calls them a heritage, not a headache. The Bible says that there was a priest in that day. His name was Eli. Eli prophesied, if you will, that they would conceive and have a child. And that child was conceived and born. His name was Samuel. The Bible, it's, it's rather, rather an intriguing story because the Bible says that Eli had two sons. They had rather odd names. If you read the story, one of them was named Hophni. The other one was Phineas, or I've heard it pronounced Phinehas, but Phineas or Phinehas. And the Bible says that Hophni and Phineas were wicked. Now, don't you think about this. Eli the priest, who walked close with God to 
actually say to a, a man of God. But the Bible says that Hophni and Phinehas were wicked. They abused their, their position as being the sons of the priest. And the Bible says that they would hang around the gate of the city and they would extort money from people that were coming in and out of the city. And the Bible said they would use their, their position, if you will, to take advantage of women as they came in and out. And they had immoral sexual relationships with women because of their position. And you read this for yourself. And the Bible says there was a day that God spoke to Eli and he said, Eli, because of this, because of this, there's going to be great judgment following you. The Bible says, listen, that in all of the things that those boys did, chapter 3, verse 13, it says, And Eli restrained them not. Are you listening to me? The priest. What a disgrace to the priesthood. What a disgrace to God's design for leadership and authority that the priest, this man of God, would not restrain his own children. And they become perverts and thieves. I'm talking about the man of God. And the Bible says that God pronounced judgment. Shortly after God pronounced judgment, both those boys were slain. The authorities had them slain, had them killed. And the ark of God was stolen, taken away. And the word came to Eli. Pastor Clay did a great job preaching on this a year or so ago. The Bible says that Eli, when he heard that his two sons had died and the ark of the covenant had been stolen, taken away, the Bible says that he fell from where he was sitting and broke his neck and died. You might say, well, why would the priest kids turn out so bad? Disobedience, listen, disobedience does not have necessarily an exclusion for a place of prominence. Eli the priest sons died an early death and I do not believe it was because of the crimes they committed it was because their father would not restrain them he, he never would say now boys you know better than that we're not doing this in our house he would not restrain them and they died now there's some very interesting parts of that story that I've and again Pastor Clay did a great job with this and I've asked myself the question, where did Eli drop the ball? Where did Eli get off track? And how many of y'all understand that personal disciplines are still part of God's landmark for a child of God? The fruit of the Spirit, temperance. That means self-discipline. That means self-control. There's a couple of words. And again, I wish I could just back up and play Pastor Clay's message on this particular individual. And I'll not look to the right hand nor to the left. I'm just going to tell you what the scripture said. The Bible says that Eli fell, broke his neck and died. And then it gave a description of him. It says, and he was heavy man. Do you know what I believe that his sons did not see in him? I believe that it's clear that his sons did not see in him personal discipline. He showed up for church on time. He said what God told him to say. But I believe that there was Otherwise, I don't believe that those two words would be in there. I believe there's a message in that. I believe that his sons did not see a, a life of personal disciplines in him. And so his sons were not disciplined. Whatever their flesh wanted, their flesh got. 
There were no restraints. The Bible says Eli restrained them not. And I just wonder if he was afraid to restrain the boys because he didn't practice self-constraint. The Bible is very descriptive, is it not? Very real. Miss Kristen, I want you to make your way to the piano, but I don't want to disturb everyone else from paying attention for the next few moments. There's another powerful illustration in Scripture in 1 Kings chapter 1. David had a son, and his name was Adonijah. And the Bible says that there came a time that Adonijah decided he was going to take over his father's kingdom. <clears throat> now, I told part of this story recently. I can't remember if I did it on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening, so bear with me if you've already heard this. It's worthy of listening again. The Bible says Adonijah decided he wanted to take over his dad's kingdom. So this little conspiracy started, and he had a plan. Ultimately, that plan was exposed, and the coup, if you will, was stopped. And the Bible says that because of Adonijah's attempt to take over the kingdom, that he was put to death. You might say, well, what, so what about that story? Well, why would Adonijah, the son of the king, plot to take over his father's position? The answer is given. The Bible says that David never displeased Adonijah. And David never displeased him. In other words, whatever pleased Adonijah, oh, David just gave it to him. You say, are you talking about King David? Yeah, I'm talking about King David, the man of God, the man after God's own heart. Whatever Adonijah wanted, Adonijah got. And I believe that was consistent with Amnon. Amnon, one of David's sons, raped his half-sister. But with Adonijah, the Bible specifically says that David never displeased him. Never displeased him. Never set him on the right path. Never said, Adonijah, you're not going to town tonight. Adonijah, you're not having a cell phone. Adonijah, you're not doing this. You're not doing that. No, whatever Adonijah wanted, Adonijah got. And Adonijah died. Because David never, never displeased him. That's what the scripture says. Parents, you need to discipline your children in the Lord. Did you hear that? In the Lord. You need to, you need to have control of your children, have your children under subjection. That means that whatever dad says is what we do. It's not up for discussion. You might say, well, is it all right for the parents, to, for the kids to ask a question? Certainly. We always let our children to ask questions, and we would graciously try to answer their, their questions and such as that. But the bottom line was, Dad, you're the king of your castle. So quit acting like the servant and start acting like the king of your castle. That does not give you a right to be arrogant and obnoxious and overbearing. As a matter of fact, it's more of a responsibility than it is a right. Fathers, train up your children the way that they should go and they won't depart from it. Ch children are like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. They're not boomerangs. They're arrows. And we point them in the right direction and they will hit their destination. So with that said, we've got till Jesus comes to finish this series and with that said, let me encourage each of you that are here today. Moms and dads, your parents, not pals. You must be a bastion, a bulwark. That strong defense, not a buddy. Pastor Clay used three words in his message the other evening. Clay, they've stuck in my mind all week. He said that he read it. It wasn't original. He read it somewhere that a father 
needs to be firm, fair, and fun. And if we leave out either one of those, we're missing the mark that God has set for us. We had fun growing up, didn't we, Steve? We grew up on a, under a disciplinarian dad and a mother who was on the same page. Our parents were firm, they were fair, and they were fun. As we raised our children, I wanted to be firm and fair and fun. Dads, you can be firm, you can be fair, and you can be firm. But listen, by the grace of God, don't be a failure. Be fair, be firm, be fun, but don't be a failure. Let's all stand.